departing from its genre blending roots, clash artifacts of chaos as you journey through the beautiful yet brutal lands of Xenozoic in search of powerful relics to challenge the mighty Gemini. Locking in as a 15 hour experience, it's constructed from modern releases while maintaining inspiration from several other classics, as it dwells upon questions about human nature, all wrapped in a visually striking art style. Set as a precursor to the series, it's isolated enough to be enjoyable to those who have not played the original games, while still living enough for the fans they were expecting more from its setting. I wasn't aware that Ace Team were the ones responsible for titles like Rock of Ages, Deadly Towers of Monsters and Abyss Odyssey, as until recently I thought they only made both Xenoclash and its sequel. Not like I didn't know about those games, I own most of them on Steam and they're all great, but it goes to show how much attention I pay to the logos that pop up when you start a game. That's why it came to me as a big surprise when Clash Artifacts of Chaos was announced because it seemed like they were giving it another try with this one spin-off based on the same universe. Say what you will about their popularity, but for such a humble indie studio to always have such a striking artistic vision to all of their projects is all sorts of amazing. Even then, I can see the game being an honest attempt at gathering a larger audience, with its mix of contemporary sensibilities both to its gameplay and presentation. Even if stating such comparisons does nothing more than to create wrong impressions, I had to draw some loose connections to games such as the 2018 reboot of God of War and The Last of Us, especially to their overall story and pacing. So if you found those to be enjoyable to any sort of degree, Clash is possibly something you might want to look into. If those overpolished and blown budgeted games are not your style, what about games like Lisa the Painful, El Shaddai, Pathologic and Soul River. All of them can be seen not only as the basis for certain gameplay elements, but also their approach to analyzing such topics such as the purpose of the self and the adaptive nature of society. If by now you have any interest in the game, please do try the game for yourself. There is no crucial piece of information I can give to better the experience, and it's better to go in completely blind into this adventure. But with that, it is a more detailed look into Clash Artifacts of Chaos. Waking up as a surreal idol of sorts, hastily put together into the shape of a man, you are given a choice between several starting combat stances. A brief tutorial helps you with the basics such as normal and special attacks, explaining how dodging is an important part to string together a fast offensive which in this ruthless world of strength is more than necessary to survive. Soon enough, you are thrown into the strange lands of Xenozoic, dense with the abnormal fauna and flora, all painted with a rich and saturated palette, like something out of a vintage pulp cover. Under the veil of the stars, surrounded by unknown yet familiar corpses, you stumble upon what appears to be your true form, later revealed to be known as Pseudo. This introduces the ability to shift between the day and night forms when resting, both necessary to progress on your journey, as there are certain torn walls that don't consort well with your flesh self. This doubly works as a second chance mechanic, as if you die during the day you are shifted into your nocturnal form for a chance to retrieve your body. With the problem being how you have to walk all the way to where you died, plus facing the encounter that kills you from the beginning. It is not uncommon for frustrating scenarios where you choke upon the remaining sliver of health, so have that in mind when you gamble with the enemy. It's never explicitly explained how this connection of the diurnal and nocturnal realities work, but personally I find it a more sensible choice than to wave off the mystery. This is a world that might seem fantastical at first, but it's surprisingly grounded when you understand it. Not long after some more learning and exploring, you come across a dispute between a bandit and an old man who is accompanied by a fuzzy ball. This provides a prime example for the one rule in all of Xenozoic, that when engaging in a clash between ideals, one can always force the opponent to face them in a ritual, a game of both skill and luck to decide on a starting benefit and a penalty to the respective winner and loser. 
This is also used to measure the opponent's character, as those who don't respect the Wound Rule are deemed of lower intelligence and therefore shunned by the denizens of Xenozoic. This results in a fatal conclusion to the old man, as Sudo finally steps in to put the bandit in his place, even after taking the penalty for not partaking in the ritual. This leaves the small feathered creature at a loss, without knowing what to do now that it's all alone in the world. Sudo asks if he doesn't have anywhere else to go, as he reluctantly explains how his brother left them because of the curse he carries. Realizing how the situation is not entirely as it seems, Sudo offers to take him to Gemini's palace where he might find a solution to this recently found situation. From this point onward, the game takes on the default profile of the rest of the playthrough. While you have an entire world to explore, the story is spaced to have you proceed through it in linear fashion, so it's not actually a common open world, but a series of interconnected exploration zones, with the opening of shortcuts making it easier for the traversal between the different regions. Interesting enough, it offers the option to have the game loading areas as separate fractions or streaming as you go along, better accommodating to the hardware you're using. This might be the best opportunity to talk about the biggest problem that the game has, which is the map design. Maintaining such quality to the visual direction while offering a large array of unique locales is nothing short of amazing, but I hope you're trained in spatial awareness, cause good god my dude, it's like every single area is the Cathedral of Sacred Blood from Code Pain. Does this look fun to navigate? Cause it fucking isn't. The case here is that a dense alien world doesn't offer much help in terms of navigation, as there is just too much of everything everywhere and most of the times it's hard to know where the correct path is. The worst case of this has to be the northern section of the map, which actually left me in fear of taking a break while traversing its labyrinthian corridors of claustrophobic shortcuts. I didn't think it was possible to feel constrained in spaces that are designed to look open, and yet here we are. On the other hand, this all might be an intended effect to further drive the bizarre nature of Xenozoic, but I said it once and I'll keep saying it every time. First focus on making a good game, and then deal with those details later. The only help you get for navigation is this small map on the pause menu, which is a bother to having to open every time you want to check where you are, but even then, it's not much cause the map is made to be an in-universe screwed rendition, so good luck trying to know the finer details. Can't believe I miss having some sort of mini-map on the screen, but this is actually a case where that would help immensely. This is further exacerbated because of how you can collect items to level up your abilities and make your healing potions stronger, but everything ends up blending too well with its surroundings, which is even worse because of how interaction detection is so tightly programmed, so there are times where you might miss items just because you weren't aligned correctly with them. I'm not claiming to know about software development, but surely you could create some sort of system where the items would be highlighted when near the player, otherwise you're gonna spend the entire game looking at your feet, worried about all the missing items instead of looking at the beautifully crafted world. All that aside, the game is great. The fighting system, while missing that AAA infinite budget, still manages to be engaging right until the end, with a great selection of unlockable combat stances and special moves that are hidden in these unique challenge statues. Even with the lack of polish, especially with the lock-on system, the moves feel and sound powerful, especially when you string together the dodge moves, creating a flow similar to a Dragon Ball Z fighting sequence of rapid movements. There is also a nod to the original games when you fill your special bar and enter a first-person mode where your moveset changes. If you manage to hit the opponent enough times during this, you will automatically do a flashy finisher and deal massive damage. You can also use weapons that deal big damage, but they break after a few uses, and as you don't have a quick way to equip them, and opening the menu doesn't actually stop time, it doesn't seem like a reliable option to use in case of danger. When facing more intelligent opponents, you have the choice to invoke the Wound Law and the Ritual minigame as enough depth to always keeping it interesting, but if you aren't into it, you can always have the boy play it for you, or just skip it altogether and attack the opponent directly like a savage. 
As you might have noticed, Sudo is designed to always contrast well with the background, but even then, you are able to get different outfits that offer stat bonuses, but it's mostly to look cool. I'm honestly surprised that there wasn't some sort of auto outfit, because I mean, look at him. It almost seems like it's on purpose. While you might think that the end point is delivering the boy to Gemini's palace, that couldn't be farther from the truth, as you quickly arrive and meet the titular owner of the place, who seems to be very interested in the fluffy boy. But after further questioning by Sudo, he finds that their agenda doesn't seem very fair to all parties, and then proceeds to get yeeted out of the window. This creates the perfect opportunity for the boy to finally reveal that his curse is being able to both cure and kill whoever he touches. With the initial plan ruined, Sudo now decides to take the boy to his brother, only to be caught in some further exposition by a certain merchant that certainly likes to reveal things. Uh. He explains how Gemini is unbeatable because she holds the prime artifact, the one which conveniently can be used infinitely because the one rule originated from it, and is the equivalent to bringing a nuke to a fist fight. Even then, if you wish to face her, you would have to fight her three bodyguards, which all have pretty powerful artifacts too, with the only existent counter to be the great shields, artifacts that can straight up nullify those corresponding powerful relics. I hope you are understanding where the story is going, because I honestly love this sort of thing. Sudo isn't really worried about any of that, because the main objective for now is delivering the boy to his brother. But as one would expect, it turns out to be a bit of a cunt. So after beating his ass, it's finally decided that you're going to slap some sense into everyone involved, Gemini included. Finally, the true journey begins as you live in search of the Great Shield artifacts, in hopes that all of this will help achieving some sort of long-term peace. It is important to note that at any time, you can just strut right back into Gemini's palace and kick everyone's ass, but you get a different, abrupt ending. Still pretty cool, and I always appreciate that sort of thing. Again, I really can't praise the game enough for the visual style of the world, be it in unique, grotesque characters that come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, to the rich environments that are completely distinct from one another. Hands down, the best design goes to Crabman, who begins by fighting with just one arm and still manages to counter your finisher, only to break off his armor when he runs out of health and goes all out for a final standing. A shame he doesn't play a bigger part in the story, but his conclusion is pretty good anyway. Not to undervalue the rest, but everything related to the Nocturne reality has some of the best monster designs I've ever seen in recent years. From the guardians that block your progress, to your own body, pieced together with parts you find across the night. It's all amazing and really brings the question as to why there is such a severe lacking of games in this type of tribal punk aesthetic, with an unorthodox use of natural materials such as wood and bone to invoke the feeling of reverence towards death in a ritualistic sort of way. If Clash was left as it is, Without any further improvements, I still believe that its style and presentation manages to carry the entire game to the end. All it needs to go from an underrated title to an all-time classic is some quality of life improvements, like item highlights, a detailed map, and a better inventory system. The game is filled with great moments, and I was pleasantly surprised at how they managed to take full advantage of the narrative potential that the setting had. It works great as a unique standalone experience, so there really is no problem if you never played Xeno Clash or its sequel. And if you are intrigued for more, then you can always go back and play them now. They are still good, even if a bit unpolished. My congratulations to Ace Team for such a wonderful game, and I hope to see more from them in the future.